Hi, everyone, and welcome to Episode 5 of the Economic Forces Podcast. I'm Brian Albrecht of Kennesaw State, and as always, I'm joined by Josh Hendrickson, who's at Ole Miss. This podcast is meant to supplement our weekly newsletter, which you can find at pricetheory.substack.com. Who's with us today, Josh? Today's guest is Casey Mulligan. Casey is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, Casey's written a bunch uh, on applied price theory topics, uh, such as labor markets and taxation and things like that. And he's also the co-author of the textbook Chicago Price Theory, which we reference pretty regularly on our newsletter. And so we just kind of want to talk to Casey today about his time at Chicago and about price theory more generally. So we like to kick things off kind of with uh, a little bit of background, I guess. And so um, maybe you can start by just talking about what Chicago was like when you got there, who were the sort of big name people who were there, who were you kind of most drawn to when you when you got there? Um, yeah, you know, I, I was a I was a Harvard undergraduate and I had my classmates weren't into working that hard. <laughs> so I had taken a lot of graduate classes I felt to get my money worth. And by the time I was a senior, uh, you know, I can just I could get a PhD. I just need one more year. And I just kind of came to Chicago to uh, as due diligence to see, you know, where I wouldn't go. Um, but I was very impressed that day by uh, Stokey and Lucas that I spent the most time with. Uh, also, Tim Conley, who was a, an advanced student at that time. And <laughs> Lucas had read my uh, senior thesis that I had sent him and, and I couldn't get anybody in the tower other than my advisor, who was a great advisor, Barrow, but otherwise I couldn't get anybody to read my senior thesis or I had to come to their office hours and ask questions and they couldn't answer them. Um, so I, it was an entirely different world on that first day. I could see that. Um, and there was a great array of, People, Ted Schultz was still around then. Um, Yair Munlach, who had done you know early work on, on, on panel data, of course, in agriculture, which where a lot of parts of economics started. Um, and macro was very big then as it is now. Um, Lars Hansen was just. Uh, starting to accumulate many, many students uh, around the links between finance and macro. Um, by the time I was there a few years, that was far and away the, the equity premium and stochastic discount factors was the, the hot topic. Um, Jose Shankman was here then, and he had been here for, for, for many years. Um, and he, a theorist, also finance, Broad, broad array of interest, like the true Chicago economist. Um, so there were there was so much to learn and such an array of people uh, to learn it from. Yeah, that's really interesting. We we've kind of uh, started off interviewing a lot of macro people, and that when we say price theory, kind of maybe think a little bit more micro. But uh, a lot of the names you brought up, you know, they 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 kind of blur these lines as long as as you do too uh one of the names you didn't mention but i know was heavily involved in your early time at chicago then as a professor was uh gary becker so how did the kind of micro before we get into uh becker per se but like micro and the becker framework how did that interact with the names that you mentioned uh stokey i believe is your advisor lucas kind of that was there a lot of interaction? Were they kind of uh, pushing each other in different ways? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, I, <clears throat> I, um, I took the f first year exam before I started. So I was accepted as a grad student, but I hadn't enrolled in my first class yet. I took the first year exam. And I said, well, you just send me the reading list. And they sent them to me. I couldn't tell which was micro, which was macro, and which was econometrics, <laughs> which I thought was an awesome thing. Um, but I had to know which one to study for on which day <laughs> because they're each given on separate days, um, especially back in that era where the stochastic discount factors. So 
you know, you could easily have a macro question in econometrics. Um, Rob Townsend was uh, one of those people who spanned those areas, and he was he would teach sometimes in the core macro and sometimes in the core micro, same course. And so the, there were no boundaries there. You know, back then, Becker and Murphy were writing things about economic growth. Um, you know, the, the rational addiction paper is, you know, totally a familiar set of tools to somebody from macro uh, and growth theory. So there was a lot of overlap. And you weren't allowed to say, that's not my area. Um, I, I learned that. It's very intimidating when you're younger. Um, but it, it makes for a great intellectual environment. Um, you know, maybe Heckman would not want to talk about macro because he didn't have a lot of respect for it, perhaps. But that's the only exception I, I can think of. Um, we were dealing with interesting, what, what we thought were interesting questions. And in fact, the boundaries even outside of economics. Now, that would be more Gary. But what he taught me was, you know, you want to answer a question with addiction or, or suicide or some topic like that. And you don't have the tools, then you better go learn the tools because you got to answer the question. You're, you're, what good are you doing if you just limit yourself to the tools that your advisors gave you uh, to answer the question? Um, so, I, I, in fact, when I was a grad student, I was getting advice on my dissertation from divinity school, from anthropology law school. Um, Becker was running a workshop with Coleman for many years, and in, including in those years, called the Rational Choice Workshop. And it included, uh, it was jointly, jointly with Posner. So, and had law school people, Landis went to all of them. Anthropologists were going to divinity school. That's where I met a lot of the people uh, I got a lot of advice from uh, Father Greeley. He's a sociologist and a Catholic priest and wrote some very interesting, enjoyable novels. Um, and he, he was really behind NORC, uh, National Opinion Research Center. Um, so he was very big on measurement um, and, and good at it. That's really interesting. I I, uh, I don't think I've heard about interaction with divinity schools. It's a stretch to have the interaction with sociology. Even that's a you know Coleman and, and Becker. That's a big deal. But all the way to divinity school. That's that's crazy. Uh, so we talked a little. You brought up Gary Becker. I thought this would be a good conversation to delve a little bit into his work uh, at the beginning. Um, he's a name that. I'm assuming all of our listeners will know, but he probably doesn't get mentioned as much on our newsletter as, as he maybe should. I wonder if you could position Gary within the broader profession if you want, but really specifically within the Chicago tradition of price theory. What made him unique, the topics, yes, but also kind of the analytical lens uh, more broadly? What, what did he bring? What, what were the conversations you could bring to him that you know, the next person who we also think of as, as a good price theorist, a good applied micro, a good whatever they are, just didn't have that Gary had. Okay, I guess I heard two questions there. So I'll start on the first. Um, Becker came from Princeton uh, and Viner had Princeton uh, background as well. Um, so Viner, was, I think, was important for Becker. Friedman was, of course. And, and, and Friedman was very inspired by Irving Fisher. I believe Irving Fisher has a price theory book, as well as some of the maybe macro books we're familiar with. Um, now, that, that's where Gary was coming from. He also uh, he wrote a senior thesis published in the AER on trade. Um, so he, he had a personal interest in trade. Th th that's where he's coming from. He wrote his dissertation and actually some other papers while a grad student <coughs> extending the boundaries of economics. He, he would say he wasn't even that interested in business type of topics. Maybe he was more a social scientist. 
in hindsight, he referred to himself to that. Um, so he had the economics of discrimination, which was his dissertation, um, which is very much a trade model and compensating differences. He um, also thought that politics should be viewed as an industry and, and the industry tools applied to that. So I believe it's the first issue of the Journal of Law and Economics volume or first volume. He wrote uh, Competition and Democracy, which he wrote as a, as a grad student as well. Um, so he was doing that already as a student. And that's, that's not something that was going on a whole lot at Chicago, but he, he got a lot of encouragement from, from people. Um, he, human capital was, was a big thing for him, but that the Ted Schultz, he was learning from Ted Schultz and saw Ted Schultz as an example there. Um, but the, the extending the boundaries is, is what, what he was doing from the very beginning. And, and, and if he didn't see that opportunity, he might not have been an economist. And then he went on, he went, his first job was in Columbia. And the Becker Columbia years are some, some great years in the history of the profession. Bill Landis was a student from there. Um, health economics got started there, Michael Grossman's dissertation. And you can go on and on from that era. And, th and that's when he wrote about the economics of crime, another extension uh, of economics, started engaging in fertility type of issues, extended you know, of course, labor supply was something studied, but extending the household production, if you want, started getting engaged in family economics. Um, so that he, he was extending all those boundaries in a, in a very successful way. Uh, I, I think a lot of his, of course, there was excess competition <laughs> in the sense that People his age at other universities would say, oh, what Becker does is obvious. And it was after he said it. Um, before he said it, it wasn't so obvious. Um, yeah, that, that, that's... And, and then he, he was teaching the 301 for a long time, maybe the longest time. Viner was teaching it way back. Uh, Friedman had a part in teaching it, Harberger. Uh, but when Becker came back from Columbia... I want to say around 1970, 71, something like that. He he was teaching that uh, up until the within a year of when he died. Did you take the 301 or did you pass out? We didn't pass uh, those classes. I, I test out of it. I, I read the uh -huh. reading list, which I realized later that none of the students actually read any of the reading list. I read the <laughs> whole thing. I thought there was a test on it. But, um, no, then I sat in that and... Most of those courses I sat in, either when I was a grad student or when I was an assistant professor. Um, and by now I've sat in, I think, a dozen, dozen Price the Econ 301s, <laughs> probably more than anyone. Easily Ho more than hopefully anyone. There's no, hopefully there's no grad students that have done it for <laughs> 12 <Right>. months. <laughs> so one of the things for Gary in, in covering all those uh, different fields you could imagine a person doing that and just writing down a bunch of different models and, and you know, relabeling things and saying, oh, this is, is uh, you know, some social preferences or something, but it was heavily empirical. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Gary's approach to empirics, and this could maybe be a, a segue into your own work that's obviously he heavily empirical. Yeah, well, the... <clears throat> The price theory itself, it, one of the key distinguishing characteristics is it's, it's for explaining the world. The world is the driver, and the theory is a passenger, you might say. Um, you're not doing theory for theory's own sake. You're not doing it for beauty uh, or to show off how smart you are. You're doing it to explain what happens in the world, predict what's going to happen next, fill in the gaps. Uh, of our data. So that by definition makes it pretty empirical. Um, and he, he was working with the data himself 
I think you, you probably use census data and uh, dissertation on discrimination. I don't have that memorized, but I'm pretty sure he did. Certainly the human capital book had a lot of census data. Um, and it is, it's not an accident. I think the 1950 census was the first one asking about earnings the way we're used to now, earnings and hours and things like that. Um, or even employment as we think of it. I think in 1940 and before there was some concepts of gainful employment and, and things like that. So um, it was a bit fortunate that the, the timing was, was good. Uh, the, the data was coming out about things that he was theorizing about. So he, the, the data was very important. I mean, he, he took, I don't want, let me say the word meta-analysis. That's not quite what I mean, but Again, you're answering a question it means you want to know all that you can know. And that's not how empirical papers are usually published, right? There's a certain data set, probably a certain class of estimators that you're using. Um, and that's all you do. And Becker, like, no, I want to know the answer to the question. And the PSID is great. <laughs> Maybe it's the best on some, but that doesn't mean that that's all I know, <laughs> not even close. And a lot of people had that attitude and taught me that uh, Lucas would be important in that too. Um, so that's what I went kind of by meta analysis. More, maybe it's more Bayesian. Uh, you want to know the answer to the question, use all the data that you can get. Um, and that it's hard to publish papers that way. That's, that's out of fashion. Um, Although I, there are plenty of people in this world who want to know the answers to questions. So I think that's a bit why Gary leaned toward books um, that you could take that more of that total approach. Um, certainly he was writing more books than, than a lot of his colleagues uh, at Chicago and elsewhere. And that's, that's part of the reason. One of the things that, uh, I was hoping you could talk about is like one of the things like when we talk about writing a newsletter on price theory, one of the things that we hear from people is like, what do you mean price theory? Isn't that just micro? And so I was wondering if you could kind of uh, explain for our listeners sort of what the difference is, you know, between the price theory approach and then sort of like the standard kind of micro approach. Yeah, that, that's a, at that general level, be tough for me to answer. So I can say the Chicago price theory. Uh, so, so I don't want to offend price theory that's outside those boundaries. Um, although, like, like I said, Chicago likes having wide boundaries, but still, there, there are boundaries there. But <clears throat> this is, one part is the Marshall tradition. Um, that you're talking about aggregates, not individuals. Um, and we maintain that a lot. Uh, you know, uh, law of large numbers, I mean, this is maybe helping you. Um, so we're interested in uh, aggregates at the market level. It doesn't mean to make it macroeconomics by any means. So that, that's important. I mean, that, that puts us further away from psychology than then some micro is, is, is sometimes practice. The other part is we tend to stay, again, this would be a Chicago price theory approach. We don't do a lot with strategy. We're not dealing with small numbers of people, one or two sellers in a market, and what's the game that they play. Um, th that's not on our top list of interests. Now you get, a, of course, as I said, if you get a problem, and you want to answer the question, and that answer depends on the strategic interactions, then you would get into that sort of issue. But we find in a lot of questions, um, our answering them requires a bunch of other tools before those kind of game theoretic tools. So that, that would be a difference. Um, the emphasis on the market equilibrium, I think auction theory is a nice contrast. The auction theories 
very active area in game theory now. Um, and, you know, there's a good to be auctioned. And it's like, well, where did it come from? Who, who invented it? After we sell this one, is there another one that we can sell? I mean, that comes very much on the fringes of auction literature entry. You know, how many items are up for auction? That's, uh, that's on the fringes where it's at the center of, of price theory. And the supply and demand would be an example. That's a, I'd say a simple example, although most people don't understand supply and demand fully. The, the picture I have behind me of the so-called Murphy football I, I love that lecture when Murphy gives it because there's a bunch of people who are looking down at their nose at supply and demand because they've understood it since they were 12, realizing that they don't understand it. <laughs> um, uh, there, there's more to learn. And not that they don't understand, but there's more to learn. There's more to do with that basic tool. Um, so that would be a difference. You, you know, we're writing an, a revision of the book because we've started to... F appreciate there's even more than we put in the book on this issue. So there's another set of tools that kind of put together some of the, say, consumer theory tools, put them together into a new tool um, that we use a lot in applications. So uh, one of my, Murphy football would be one, but another one would be the more familiar to your uh, listeners would be excess burden. You know, an MGW book, they say the cost function, which the excess burden is a transformation of the cost function. Um, they say the cost function is useless, except maybe if you want to prepare a technical proof, you'd want to be on top of the cost function, they say. No, excess burden is used for so many things. I mean, throughout public finance, obviously, um, and, Har and Harberger really got that train rolling. Uh, great for analyzing disease. You know, very early, I, I was using excess burden. Uh, Murphy was too, Philipson. Very early in this pandemic, we said, you know, this is an excess burden question. And you know, when we say we get a vaccine, what's going to happen? Well, this is like excess burden. You're cutting the tax rate. You might get more revenue, which I'm afraid would mean dead people in this application. So we get the vaccine if it's not perfect. So you're not at that origin in the Laffer pur curve picture, you could be on the wrong side in that sense. The vi virus could have been on the wrong side, so you get a better vaccine and more people will die. Doesn't mean it's a bad thing, um, right? Revenue is a bad thing in this application, uh, but it means people are taking the benefits of the vaccine in other ways. Uh, and vice versa, you don't want to measure the success of the vaccine on the basis of what happens to the death rate? Um, I mean, there's an envelope theorem you could use that holds certain things constant, but certainly you don't want to look at the time series of the death rate before and after the vaccine it would be a foolish thing to do. Because, uh, And I think we're seeing that now. The benefits of the vaccine are very much we get to live more a normal life. So <clears throat> Marshall's Law is another one. I think we need to have a whole chapter on uh, applications of Marshall's Law. It, it's throughout the book, right? It needs a chapter, scale and substitution effects um, in different instances. I, I, when I was in the White House, I ran into a team that's trying to measure the effects of regulation. And then they say, okay, we're going to regress employment on regulation. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> I don't know whether regulation at the industry by year level, let's say. I don't know, regulation, a bad regulation may increase employment, it may decrease employment. It depends on the scale and substitution effects, right? It's obvious once you apply it, but it's a key tool um, that you may see Marshall's Law in a footnote in a micro book, but they won't, you won't see it applied. Um, and there's so many of those, the last to see of one sort of question. The question, we get robots. It's a similar question. If the trucking industry get robots, does that mean truckers are out of a job? No, you might need more truckers. <laughs> Now, maybe to do something a little different, but you might need more employment in that industry. So it all depends on the scale and substitution effects. Um, so I, I, that's that'd be another difference that we've we've combined some of these fundamental tools that we might share with Michael, like Hicksian demand or Marshallian demand, into a 
another set of tools that are more ready and versatile for application. I wonder if we could dig into that a little bit more, and we'll get back to other work uh, you have on, on regulations. But let's take the, the regulation example and the regression that you specified. Could, could you say a little bit more about uh, you know, your own approach, or if you want to call it the Chicago price theory approach, whatever it is, your approach, uh, and how that differs from standard applied micro that as done by you know, a large fraction of, of the profession? What are you looking at differently uh, you know, where is the question starting and ending? Just some compare and contrast there. You know, I'm not sure I thought of that in such generic terms, but let me uh, roll through my mind a little bit to some of the things that we've done. Um, well, so let me, let me, okay, let me phrase ahead. it a slightly different way. So you are obviously, take your time uh, with the CEA, you're obviously working around a lot of other economists. Like So there's there's the distinction between how economists think about problems and non-economists, but then within economists, um, you're going to be approaching it differently than, than others who will be maybe looking at exclusion restrictions and, and looking for some exogeneity that they're trying to uh, start with. Um, is there a way, is there a, 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 maybe not perfect distinction, but is there some uh, way in which you saw, okay, even in my conversation with the economists in, in the room, here's something that they seem to be missing on, let's say, regulation. Well, especially the younger ones. I mean, they, they took a theory class and they saw it as useless and probably at the level they were taught it, it was useless. So they weren't using the theory, really. I mean, uh, it's hard to imagine how you function, but I guess they managed to function. Um, and I, I would first be th talking about things like Marshall's Law. Um, or one of the questions that we always posed, we saw a lot of regulations because President Trump wanted to get rid of so many of them and wanted to know what results would be. You know, what happens to the rectangle? It, the regulation is doing something to the market, changing the quantity, changing the price. There's a rectangle there. What happens to it? Is, is that a benefit for somebody, usually the producers? Or is it used up in resources? Um, that affects how you answer and analyze the question. And it, you have to pose it first <laughs> to even know which, what to do. Um, and that, that's another thing. If you look in the economic report of the president during those years, you can see that we, we, we did that a lot. Um, and that kind of brought the... That was a Tullock insight, right, uh, about dissipation, um, what happens to the monopoly rectangle. So that's not just a Chicago thing by any means, but it reminds me of the debate between Friedman and Stigler that they had. Uh, Stigler died actually six months after I got on campus um, and Friedman was already out in California. But they would argue, you know, Stigler was a capture view that we have these public policies that we think ought to be changed in our profession. We think they ought to be changed. We have them for a reason, uh, probably because there's a special interest that's close to the center of power that gets a benefit from it. And then there's Friedman view, especially younger Friedman. No, if we just gave more economic classes, if he just sat in the car with more cab drivers and explained to them, which he loved to do, um, they would understand and the voters would vote for a better outcome. And that was kind of the battle back and forth. Um, and that, that's related to the rectangle and uh, how's the rectangle used sort of question. So one of the things that I was going to uh, bring up is that, so um, during your time in the Trump administration, I think, um, well, I mean, you wrote about this um, in in your book about your time in the Trump administration. But I was wondering if, you know, um, you could kind of talk about sort of unique perspectives that um, people like you and Tom Phillipson were bringing to the CEA that aren't necessarily always present at the, at the CEA. 
you know, America was really lucky that Philipson was there when he was uh, really lucky. Because he had started the economics of infectious disease with Posner. That came out of one of those workshops. And those two met each other at one of those workshops through the, the Divinity School and the archaeology and everyone there. Those two met. And <clears throat> that was back in the era where AIDS was a very serious infectious disease in our country and in the world. And they said, you know, we got to work out the economics of that. <laughs> Incentives are here. What does that mean? Um, they wrote a book together. Uh, well, it was a series of papers. Um, so that was one thing that was different. Uh, and we had worked on infectious disease pandemics before the pandemic. And it's largely because of Tom. I mean, Tom had that background. And there were national security people running around who were worried about pandemics before this pandemic came. And there was a natural team that, that, that we got into when we worked on that. The other thing that kind of led Tom, I mean, once he got into the AIDS, what happened with AIDS, also that there's a tradition at Chicago before Tom about the innovation that AIDS, <laughs> their attitude was often, well, if we just teach people to have safe sex, then AIDS will go away. They tried that, didn't work. <laughs> and what you saw with AIDS is what, what got that, situation under better control was medical innovation, new inventions, new treatments. And that did it. And, and Tom, by the pretty early in his career, he had the view that medical innovations may be the most important single subject um, to study. Peltzman, you know, of course, had an early paper on how regulation gets in the way of medical innovation and all the loss that consumers suffer from that, uh, Murphy and Topel wrote a book about the value of medical innovations within the trillions of dollars that American values, a value that Americans get from medical innovation. So that was pretty different. Uh, and it's not an accident that our pandemic analysis and in the president's executive order around the pandemic was very much centered on medical innovation. We have a pandemic, our way out is medical innovation, vaccine innovation, specifically, but innovation in general. Um, and really, the government's got to get out of the way. We don't want to make that Peltzman, the, the mistake that Peltzman found, we don't want to be repeating that. Um, that's going to harm, harm people in America and in the world. Yeah, that's, this may be a good time to say a little bit more about your, your work on the pandemic and, and the policy responses, because um, I know you've, you've written a bunch on it, at least according to MBER, at least four papers uh, s surrounding directly COVID and COVID policy. The one I, I'm a big fan of is the backward art of slowing the spread. It's got a nice little theoretical result. Um, I wonder if you could explain that a little bit, why it's unintuitive and what uh, you, you see is your, the theory you're bringing that let's say what most economists seem to do is write down a model, add a SIR model on top of it and spit out something. You seem to take a different approach. I wonder if you could, again, compare and contrast those. Yeah, you know, something in the folklore at, at Chicago for, for many years was, you know, we'd kind of shake our heads around the word externality. Not, not that we didn't believe in externalities, no. Not at all. It's just that how little thought, how much the word is used and with so little thought. And, and, and you guys have some pieces where you say, yeah, wait, we got to give this some thought. You guys are quite rare <laughs> and, and using your brain, <laughs> parking your brain on that topic for an extended period of time. Um, it was in the Phillips and Posner book too. They said, yeah, Diseases involve externalities, but be careful thinking through. Um, so that that was really the approach I, I brought here in this pandemic. It's like, oh, yeah, there's externalities, but let's slow down. Why, what direction do they go? And, and one of the claims that was made, um, even by the Trump team, I was gone from the White House by then, but they thought that work, work is a negative externality during the pandemic. 
because you're going to go to work and give it to everybody and then they're going to go home and give it to everybody and but never ending cycle. Um, and I just didn't see that the basic theory of externalities, which wouldn't be in the micro books, but apparently the microeconomists didn't want to use it in the last two years. It says, wait, no, wait. The theory really points in the other direction that, you know, you have the Samuelson result about, well, when people cooperate, their demand for public goods increases tremendously on a per capita basis. It's really proportional. That's actually a quantitative prediction from price theory, not just a qualitative one. So when, when we're at work at the University of Chicago, we've got 40,000 people. We got 40,000 demand, or we got a family of 40, we got 10,000 the demand when we're together at the university than when we are at home. Now, it's not exactly a public good and stuff like that, but that's one thing pointing that the demand for prevention would be much greater if we were at work than if we were all at, at home and working in, you know, separately. And the other part would be the supply. And I give the example of the great leap forward when Mao told everyone to make steel in your backyard. We can laugh at that. It was tragic what happened. Guess what? Steel's not something you make very well in your backyard. It's really you need a bigger factory than that to do it well. And I thought you at least got to ask the question, is disease prevention something that's made well in your backyard or is it better made in a large organization? Um, and so that I really, the price theory was got what we got on the topic. Of course, it's applied. So we can't stop there at all. It's about the world. And so I started looking around for, well, what does the data say? Does the data tell me about how disease is transmitted in workplaces and schools as compared to homes or whatever it is people do when they're not at a workplace? And there's a huge difference. And it's not in the direction that we were promised. We were promised that work was the place where we were going to spread it so we couldn't go there. We needed to pay people to go anywhere but work. Well, uh, the, the data seems to show the opposite. I mean, there's plenty of room to measure more. Um, but if work were so terrible, boy, it's sure having trouble showing itself in data. Yeah, it's really interesting, kind of a different response to incentives. Like, usually when we think of externalities, the whole idea is, oh, it's an it's a it's something out there that you don't have an incentive to respond to, but that's not true if you have any sort of uh, collective group making decisions as you would in a family, right? Me and my wife make decisions together, or at at a firm at a university. Um, so taking that basic idea that you're going to respond to some incentives and that can reverse uh, you know, the the direction of, of the effect uh, also applies to externalities for sure. Yeah, and then. That I mean, there's no doubt. In fact, tell me things that we don't do in some kind of group. Mm -hmm. We have the family, which is a group, small. I mean, some people are in one-person families, but otherwise it's a, it's a small group. You got the firm, you got your study group, you got the classes that you're in, your, your, your department within the firm. And then, of course, there's the whole polity, which would be a very, very large group. Um, and for some reason... We say the word externality, and then it means that all the action has to come at the polity level, which I, I guess is the federal level. Or, um, but I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense uh, on much reflection. So I'd like to go back. Uh, it's super interesting talking about uh, COVID, but I came across your work. I came kind of of age in economics when when uh, coming out of the Great Recession and and blogs were big and whatnot. But really the Great Recession was kind of my defining, you know, what got me interested in economics, both the financial crisis and then the following Great Recession. And you've written a, a ton on uh, you know, the slow economic recovery, particularly policies related to it. I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on kind of the main theories of, of why especially uh, e economic growth was slow after the recession and how your approach and the way you think about it is different than kind of the general stories that you hear out there. Yeah, the, I mean, it does remind me a bit of, of Becker's career and some others' career. I mean, there's certain trends 
And in your career, you might not want to be bucking those trends. Uh, might not want to be an agricultural economist in, beginning in 1960. <laughs> and what, what was going on at the time when, when Lehman failed, especially, we all, the issue all had our attention. And everybody wanted to be a housing economist, a mortgage economist at the time. And one of the things, a couple of things I saw about that. One, the capture was so obvious. Uh, there's certainly a group of people who are powerful who stand to benefit from some massive bank bailout. And of course, they're going to be happy to sponsor all kinds of theories about how bailing out the, a very few bankers is good for the whole world. Um, so there was that part of it. Um, but I felt that, it, the, and Friedman's monetary history kind of influenced me on that. The bank situation will solve itself pretty quickly, measured in weeks, maybe months. Whereas some of the problems with uh, human capital, those, those are going to drag out for a much longer period of time. Um, and so I started on, on really the labor side of things. I mean, that was the definition of a recession or a depression is, by definition, the amount of labor goes down. Employment number of jobs goes down. And that's... Uh, so even, you're almost biased toward finding a labor conclusion because you've defined the event based on labor. So I said, so why aren't we looking at labor more directly rather than such indirect route to things? And then I realized what was going on in terms of the policy. We were literally coming up with a dozen new ways to pay people not to work. So, yeah, we're going to have people not working, and that's going to last as, at least as long, maybe longer, than these programs would last. And that's that, that's kind of how I was approaching it, and I felt my story is going to grow with interest. <laughs> People are going to still want to study the ways we pay people not to work 10 years from now. And the number of people who want to study mortgages is going to shrink down to what it was, which was a pretty small group. I think that's where we got. So one of the big uh, things I take out of your work is, is, as you said, you know, you pay people not to work or equivalently have some very high marginal tax rate because of losing you know, different benefits, government policy benefits. Um, but you also brought up human capital. I wonder if you could say more about the role of human capital in the, the slow growth. Is it just that capital by its, defin by its nature is, you know, a longer lasting thing or is there, is there a little bit more to it then? Well, I mean, I mean in the first instance, just that human capital is the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Labor income is 70% of national income. So, that's that's a much bigger deal. And then <laughs> when you're left with the third, you know, a lot of that capital is not incorporated, is not traded on exchanges, is not financed with bank loans. I mean, it, the stuff that was related to Lehman is pretty small chunk by comparison. So that's what I meant at the time. And in the book, I didn't do a whole lot of human capital because I was in a little short run time horizon. Um, but certainly in a longer period. And I think in this recession, I'm giving more attention to human capital type of issues. Um, I mean, put people out of work and that affects how they're going to invest. They're going to invest in non-market skills instead of market skills. Um, you, you had that famous paper by Chargin and Lundquist about the European disease. You had these people on unemployment all these years and then they didn't know how to work. Um, they, they wouldn't get paid very much if you forced them to work at, after a period of time. Um, and, and that the more time that goes by, the more the human capital part becomes important. And I think in this recession, you're seeing that in particular type of human capital related to drug abuse. I think, you know, once history of drug consumption, you can think of this stock of capital. And that stock's changed a lot, we know. We know the tragic information on that here. Um, and that was less of an issue in the 
previous recession. Is that a, uh, something that's changed? Just there's a trend uh, in, in drug abuse and because we're starting at a higher level, any fluctuation is a percentage fluctuation is going to be higher or, or yeah, what I, has I changed? Think, I think you can, <clears throat> there's a trend in the quantity. And now, maybe that begs the question, why is there a trend in the quantity? Has there been a trend in the prices? I mean, there's been technological change, synthetic we had synthetic clothing a long time ago. Ch totally changed the clothing industry. Um, we have had synthetic other materials that have been huge. Well, now we have synthetic drugs, and that's totally changed the drug industry. Made it much cheaper. People can can buy a lot more than they used to with the same income, and so that that that's led to a trend. And so now, when you send people out of work. And there's this non-work opportunity calling them or them calling it. Um, a lot of them engage in it. I'm sure there were millions of people this time starting drug habits. Some of them able to end it when it's time to go back to work. Others not. So I think I want to try to tie that into what's I want to try to tie in your work on sort of what was going on in the previous recession to kind of what's going on now. So I think, um, you know, we've sort of had this like unprecedented change in the uh, economy since this pandemic. And um, sort of, you know, we've had a lot of sort of policy interventions and, um, you know, we had a lot of things sort of shut down and reopen and i think like one of the things we're learning is that uh you know it, the the economy is not like you know a computer when you turn it off and turn it back on again it doesn't improve performance it seems to make things worse and so i think like right now is a time when economists are extremely valuable um but one thing that they're valuable at is uh, you know kind of interpreting what policymakers want to do about these problems and, and things like that. And so we're kind of told all the time lately that uh, policies like build back better and that kind of stuff is really important to sort of fixing all of these uh, problems. And so one of the things that makes you unique is you actually read this legislation. So um, I kind of wanted to ask you about this legislation and sort of, so, you know, in, in a couple of ways, sort of what what's in it um, you know, I, I want to know it from somebody who's read it, um, you know, not, you know, from the news reports of what's in it, but what's in it. And, you know, um, what, what should we as economists be diving into that's, that's in it? And what can we as economists kind of say about what we expect to happen if, you know, if, if they were to actually get this passed? Um, <clears throat> Well, there's different industries, let's say, that are very much touched by the bill. Those you've probably heard, uh, energy industry, childcare uh, industry, um, trying to remember the different versions, I have to check. In my notes, um, retirement savings was, was an issue in there. Uh, I, I think some privacy, so, some telecommunications issues. Um, a general theme in that has been very much centrally directed. So energy, you know, maybe the energy is not the right size and composition, than we want. Although again, we, I would want to be careful about that externality thing, but let's put that aside to actually get to your question. Um, you know, the, the way that bill would change would be very much centrally directed and saying, we're going to have more of this type of equipment and more of that type of equipment. Um, you know, it, innovation is nowhere on the radar there. Um, it's, it's, the authors obviously are not imagining that somebody might invent something um, to get us out of this problem 
um, or perceived problem um, that no, we, we have the answers and we're going to tell people what to do. Um, so that'll leave you concerned, even if you agree with the goals in the Build Back Better, that it'll be centrally directed. This means the goals are not going to be achieved. You might have the opposite of the goals achieved. Um, so I, I would pay attention to that. Um, a lot of special interests. That's what happens when you have, you know, when central planning, who did it benefit? The Communist Party, of course. They, to be a, that was a way to keep people members of the Communist Party in the centrally planned system. You could actually get a little bit of what you wanted if you were a party member. If you were a non-party member, forget about it. You're, you're going to be hungry. Um, and so it, it, it confers a lot of power. Um, and, and some in pretty obvious ways, like labor unions are named in there in a bunch of places. Um, oh, I, we need people to get more electric cars. Oh, but the electric cars that are made by union factories and not, instead of non-union factories, stuff like that. Um, and in a lot of other more subtle ways to, to do that. Um, there's, there's no, apparently no attention to incentives, incentives to work, incentive to be married. Um, so a lot of these, as they implement, say, childcare, they're implemented in a way that encourages people to earn less, encourages people to have just mom in the house and not dad. Um, putting a lot of, when I say encourage, I mean a big financial difference. And in addition to the ones that are already there between having mom in the house and dad in the house, um, there's, a, there's a, lot, a lot in there. Um, and across the board, I mean, in the energy stuff, a lot of the energy policies are, oh, we have to be below the poverty line to have this certain energy benefit. If you're above the poverty line, too bad. Uh, you want to get an electric bike? Well, <laughs> we'll pay for your part of your electric bike, depending on how poor you are. Mm -hmm. Tons of stuff like that. No attempt to add it all up, the, add up all the incentives. Obviously, there are some groups trying to add up the budget lines to a bottom line budget line, but nobody adding up incentives, mm -hmm. um, which is you would think that's how economists ought to think about it. So one of the things you brought up early in that is the importance of, of innovation and, and things that are lost. And innovation has been a thing that's came up a few times in this conversation. Um, so I wish... I was wondering if we could maybe close out here talking a little bit about policy for innovation. This might be a time to mention briefly uh, Operation Warp Speed and things along that lines. But more generally, what what could – suppose we're not going to take the Stigler route and we think that economists can maybe persuade uh, people. It's not just all special interest group. Uh, what are policies that could encourage innovation given that we – don't accept you know central planning as a viable alternative. What else can we do? I mean, aside from freedom. Uh, so well, I mean, is that is that it? Is that the the main thing, or is there? Uh, it's hard to improve yeah. on now. Property rights is is something. I mean, naturally, we get into in, in price theory. Um. And there's the great question of intellectual property rights. Um, when somebody has an innovation, how can they personally benefit from creating that thing? Um, I put that more as a question, but I understand policymakers don't want to wait till we answer the questions. But so then I would just be careful. Let's be careful. You know what? What are we doing to the incentive to innovate? Um, and the Build Back Better has the latest version. Some of the versions didn't have a bunch of regulation of the pharmaceutical industry, in particular brand name pharmaceuticals, where that's where the innovation, some of the innovation happens. Um, I do, you'd want to be careful around that. Are, are you going to hurt innovation? It would be a shame 
to lose some of these innovations, given the ones that we've had have been so amazing for people. And I, there's a lot of room in price theory, I think, to work on that. You know, the standard view is that the patent has this static cost of reducing the quantity. It's actually a little hard to find empirically. When you find a farm pharmaceutical product go off patent, does the industry sell less? It's not so easy to find. And why? What's going on? Um, I'm not sure our thinking about intellectual property rights is fully integrated with our empirical knowledge of some of how these industries work. So there's lots more work to be done. I wish I, I could tell my students, I wish I were your age because I got a lot of dissertations to, to write. There are many, many good dissertations unwritten. That, uh, I'm confident they'll be written in the next few years. Well, I'm wondering a bit um, what you kind of learned from your experience being involved in policymaking itself. So um, did you find it difficult to gain uh, traction for kind of these price theory insights? I know like I know like in your book, for example, you talked a little bit about, you know, um, everybody uh, has their own sort of interests that they're trying to push, right? When they're uh, in the White House or when, you know, you're talking about a particular policy and things like that. But um, just overall, um, you know, economists talk a lot about policy, but when you're actually like involved in the policymaking process, um, you know, what, what was it like? And did you find it easy to make, you know, these sort of, price theory arguments convincing to, to other people, or was that more difficult than you expected, or what was that like? It was very easy, but I think the circumstances are unique. I'd like to hear from somebody else uh, who worked for a different president, but Trump was doing so much, and his, his advisors couldn't keep track of it. Um, well, the press didn't keep track of it, and his advisors couldn't keep track and that's where a theorist is the most helpful. The, you know, that's the point of theory, right? To organize the complexity. Um, and so they were hungry. but They didn't know it until they were presented with the meal. But they were hungry with, for ways to organize all their achievements. Um, and they were very much under bragging. You think of Trump as like the world's best bragger. He is pretty good at marketing, but... It, he wasn't able to brag fast enough on all the things that he was doing. And price theory definitely provided a framework for organizing that. It also provided us advisors a framework for organizing in other ways. You know, how do you categorize regulations? He, he was ripping out hundreds of them. Well, what buckets do you put him in? So he can brag about bucket one, bucket two, bucket three. Price theory is a very natural way to... Uh, to do that. So they very much liked what, what was going on there. And it's not an accident, the number of Chicago people that were there, more kept coming. Um, Trump's political team was very, very happy with, with that. And you even listen to Trump, give one lesson that Philipson gave, gave to Trump, and I could very much I saw it in a rally that I watched on YouTube, but I could totally see Philipson's was what taught him. But, but there was this question of, sh should we have a most favored nation rule on pharm pharmaceuticals? So if the drug's selling somewhere in the world for 10 and it costs 20 here, should Americans be allowed to pay 10? And Philipson explained kind of the full equilibrium there that, well, that our 20 could go down, but that other 10 could go up. And then I heard Trump explain that to a rally. <laughs> so not only did he listen, but he was able to articulate it in the most important forum from, from his point of view. Um, and that, so, and there were a lot of episodes like that. I mean, it's not an accident that Trump had an executive order that medical innovations are way out of a pandemic. And you kept hearing Trump talk about that, right? It's not like somebody wrote up the order and he just slapped his signature on the bottom. He had no idea what was in it. You heard him throughout 
the pandemic. It's like, well, we got the vaccine by the end of the year. And don't forget about the therapeutics and this and that. Everybody forgot, but he was there was very much on his radar that innovation was going to be helping people in it in huge ways. Well, that's a natural spot uh, to wrap up for us. I I would recommend all of our listeners to read You're Hired, uh, where Casey goes into more stories uh, about his time in policymaking. We also mentioned the Price Theory textbook, Chicago Price Theory, uh, and also his his book on the Great Recession, The Redistributive Recession. So I'd like to thank Casey for joining us on the Economic Forces podcast. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, guys.